My hope is that the work that we will have done will have truly enabled a faster adoption of solar through lower cost hardware, through a higher accessibility to a better technology, to enabling more people to enter the industry who may not have the resources or training through easier products to work with, and to enable products and to push the industry to really focus on delivering something that lasts a long time and isn't just going to be replaced in five years. Kai Stefan is the founder and CEO of Pegasus, one of the fastest growing solar mounting software and hardware solution providers here in the United States. And after spending a couple of years sailing off grid through Mexico and Central America with his family, Kai was hooked and he knew that he wanted a career in solar like many of you. But how he transitioned from that steady paycheck at SoCal Edison to solving the time and complexity challenges inherent in what was the existing solar mounting system ecosystem, if you will, or infrastructure. It's a classic entrepreneur story. Today, you'll get the inside scoop. If you would like more conversations like this and you haven't yet subscribed to Suncast, what are you waiting for? Hit that subscribe button. And if you love this kind of conversation and this isn't your first time back, please leave us a rating and review so other smart folks just like yourself will find the show like you did at some point. Thank you for being here. Now let's get ready to tune up your skills, Solar Warrior, as we tune into another powerful conversation here on Suncast. Kai, it's good to see you, my friend. It's a long time coming. I am super, super stoked that one of the companies that makes uh, a t-shirt that I wear so often is uh, finally <laughs> able to make a debut here on Suncast. Good to see you, man. Yeah, happy to be here. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, I. Uh, it's funny how many people ask me why there's no I in the skip rail name on the t-shirt that I'm wearing. It works. <laughs> it works. I love the, um, and my dad, as I as predicted, would love, he loved the Pegasus name because he had a big Pegasus on his shoulder. I don't know if I told you that, but oh, my dad's got Pegasus. It was like his second or first or second tattoo. Uh, hmm. Yeah. I'd love to, at a, at a high level, before we dive into the exact work that has uh, so occupied your life for more than a decade now, um, how do you describe to folks that have no idea what's going on and what your business is generally about? How do you describe the problem that you created your business to solve? Well, at a very high level, um, I've been interested in how to accelerate our society at large to clean energy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we can go into the details of, of you know, how, how Pegasus was started, but how to really accelerate the adoption of solar energy. When I was um, right out of school in, in 2009, I was exposed to a number of different renewable energy resources. I was doing renewable energy integration as one of my um, job functions, looking at wind power, solar, et cetera, and um, realized that or had this belief that solar was going to become the dominant source mm -hmm. of power um, because of its manufacturer scalability, its right. now moving parts. So um, how, how to accelerate the adoption of solar energy. Um, and that, that was really the, the driving force into the problem set. Um, and there's a number of items that go into that, whether it's on the financing side or the technology side or the policy side. Um, my background is in mechanical engineering, and so I wanted to focus on the on the on the hardware side and the technology side. Mm -hmm. That's what really drove into how do we make things not just faster to install, but easier to install, um, and remove those barriers, lower cost to just generally accelerate the technology, solar energy. Yeah. Um, to be widespread at a, at a global scale. So for the layperson that doesn't know how solar panels come together, broadly speaking, there are three main categories. There's the module, the inverter, and the balance of system. And within the balance of system, the major component is what we commonly refer to as the racking. And as any installation crew will tell you, tightening the modules isn't that fa isn't that, doesn't take that, take that much time. Putting... The inverter on the wall, frankly, doesn't take that much time. Even running the wires down from the roof, it usually comes down to how easy or not 
is it to install the those pesky racks, right? So why don't you introduce us to Pegasus, a company that has innovated uh, in, a, in a really novel fashion around the the lowly, simple, often aluminum, you know, extruded aluminum or steel mm-hmm. racking, the infrastructure, the thing that disappears, the thing behind the panel that nobody really pays that much attention to after the, the install is over. Tell us why uh, Pegasus is helping solve some of these sort of speed to market problems that you identified. Pegasus, we're a software and a hardware company. Um, we've been focused on developing our hardware for over a decade now, but over the last two years in particular, we've put a lot of effort in the software side. And um, it goes back to that accelerating the adoption of solar. And there's a couple different things that we do with our rack and software to help do that. There's lowering the actual cost of the material itself. And we've done it through some of our technologies. There's being able to enable actual faster installation. Um, and then there's also um, how do we make it more accessible so that, you know, even lower skilled labor can also install um, our systems and not have to have as high of a, a training curve. So um, you're, you're right. There's ma- three main things. There's the module, the inverter, and the racking. Um, with the, the racking, it's it's almost a religious experience for installers because there's this whole curve of training and learning the product. Um, and so um, it drives a lot of the throughput of the on-site installation. The modules in terms of the installation process is relatively the same. Mm-hmm. Inverters gets a little more complicated, whether it's microinverters or string inverters and some of their other particularities. But it's the racking system that is the majority of the workflow there. Um, and so we really focus on the hardware side of how do we make that whole process smoother? When we are looking at the installation throughput, we are not looking at just the guys on the roof, mm-hmm. guys or gals on the roof. We are looking at the entire chain. And I think that's where it allows for that continual uh, rapid adoption, where it's how does it move from our suppliers to us? How does it go from us to our distributors? How do the distributors um, or our other installation partners package and ship it onto the trucks uh, that then drive to the home? How is it carried up the ladder? Mm -hmm. Then how is it actually installed? And then what is it like for the lifetime of the project itself? And it's all of those things that come together to make Mm -hmm. the system smoother and faster um, and lower the installation skill set and also provide a, a increased durability for the for the life of the system. What are some of the things that you've observed as uh, I'll say expendable ways that you've seen that doing things the same way won't help us speed up, and so you've been able to innovate around them to, uh, for instance, as you mentioned, reduce install time and reduce uh, the amount of labor required. Some of the problems that we were looking to solve, one is continuing to lower the cost of the actual hardware itself. Um, Another was how to make it just an easier system. Mm -hmm. And so I think so often people just focus on cost, 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 Um, but that can come actually at a cost because Mm -hmm. it may make it more difficult to install. It may require more training. Um, It may require a higher installations skill set bar for their crews. And so um, initially, we really focus on how to just reduce raw material through some of our early products. But we realized that the problem set was really, um, yes, keep hardware cost um, as a forefront area to focus on. Mm-hmm. But how to make it so that it can just be easy through the whole chain uh, and provide uh, a smoother experience for installers on the roof and a longer lasting product for homeowners. Um, Some of the problems that we've um, really focused on over the last few years is there's been a a whole slew of new technologies around how to waterproof a roof penetration. And that has become a bigger problem actually in the industry of roofs leaking. Um, It was a long time ago and then um, flashings became prevalent and then there's been a number of flashless products that have been problematic in in certain areas. And so that's been another area of how do we make a product that 
Um, we're not just going for something really low cost that needs to be replaced in a few years. It has to have a durability to it that lasts mm. or outlasts the roof itself. Yeah. And that to me is such an important thing because, you know, something may be um, 10% lower cost or 15% lower cost, but if it has to be replaced in five years, right. it is not 10% lower cost. It's 80% more cost because yeah. you're buying two of them. In particular, if it's something that's underneath the solar array. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's another uh, point I want to make is um, yes, there's a focus on hardware cost in the racking, but it is really expensive if you have to replace or fix anything because yeah. a lot of the cost in a solar installation is the labor, the crews getting on yep. a truck to drive out there, um, dealing with the homeowner being um, unhappy and honestly, just the time, that's a lost opportunity of another yeah. install that could be done. I think that racking is that critical component. You said it before, and I've never heard anybody say it that way, but it's a religious experience. And I know what you mean by that. Here's the thing. A contractor wants to find as many repeatable p parts of the product as pros possible, right? The, the, the um, set it and forget it mentality. Because you don't want to have to retrain your crew, but you also have to find something that you know is going to stay there and the, the racking, A, has it is literally the thing that holds the whole product to the roof. It holds the mm -hmm. panels to the roof, right? Um, yep. So it's probably, it's the unsung hero. It's the critical component to the solar array. Uh, B, of all of the operations and maintenance is the biggest pain in the ass. If there's a problem with the flashing, if there's a problem with the footing, the actual interface that connects it to that rafter, everything else has to be removed. Yep. Um, and that is the most costly service call possible. So as an installer, I'm going to avoid that at all costs. I'm going to choose the product right up front. I'm never, I'm never going to change that product once I've found something that I trust. That's what I, I believe you mean by it's a religious experience, right? Totally. Yeah. yeah. And it's, there's, you know, modules, you have one SKU you're dealing with. Yeah. Inverters, there's maybe five. Racking, there's you know, 15 or 20 because you have yeah. all the different roof types, et cetera. So there's just a lot to learn. There's a lot of inventory to manage. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, once once someone gets really stuck on a system, um, they, li they like to use that. Yeah. Des describe the aha moment when you came up with the InstaFlash idea. I, I think the bigger thing is really our product development process that led yeah. to it. Okay. So... That, I think, has allowed us to develop more and more innovative products that um, beyond any one of us in terms of having a, a aha moment. Yeah. So as an engineer, and most engineers, they will have pride around an idea they make and may be very stubborn about it's going to be this way or the highway. <laughs> and as we've gone, as I've gone through the years of uh, product failures and successes, mm -hmm. um, along with many of the members here still at Pegasus is we've learned that um, to have an ability to scrap your own idea, to have a humility around mm -hmm. what works and what doesn't work and really, really listen to the customer and really, it's not just listen, but observe the customer. That is a, that is a, a really important distinction. Yeah. Um, and so that process allowed us to come up with some of these products like InstaFlash. The aha moment with InstaFlash is we didn't approach it with a product in mind. We approached the problem first and then decided how to make a product that really um, solved that problem. The problem was um, a product where you did not have to pry up shingles, which a traditional flashing um, does. You do need to do that which risks tearing the shingles, um, but then also had a sealant pre-installed in it because we heard from many installers that some of their leaks were caused by crew members just simply forgetting to install sealant. You yeah. know, you have a new crew member on the roof and they're going fast and, hey, did you put sealant on those ones over there? Oh, yeah, I did. Well, he meant the other array, not, you know, not array four or whatever. Right. So, um how do we have a pre-installed sealant? And that led to this whole, uh, I mean, really rabbit hole of sealant development. It's a custom formulated sealant that we had to create. No way. Um, 
that doesn't need to have any kind of liner or packaging around it. But it started with the problem. That was the key thing. It started with the problem. We didn't have something and try to force it into, you should buy this. It was, this is really the problem we need to solve. Yeah. So we had a lot of ideas that we have scrapped through that process. Good ideas that, that some of us really wanted to see, you know, out in the market. But it's honing back to what really is the problem set. Um, and that's kind of what led to it. What solutions, many people who've been on the roof would know the answer to this, but, but probably many listening aren't. What solutions existed um, that, that you had to sort of rethink how the application works? Like what was the traditional fastening me- methodology? Well, <laughs> um, one thing I joke about when we talk about you know, our or traditional rail systems, they've been around since the dawn of solar, effectively. Yeah. You want to have mm-hmm. uh, a solar panel on roof, you know, back in the day, you're buying Unistrut from Home Depot and, and putting on there. It's effectively uh-huh. a rail system. Yeah. And so that general concept has been around forever. Uh, largely, it's still the same concept, but it's where the differences that um, we've uh, observed have made it completely different of a product. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, that comes from our our product development process. Um, I think one thing that's been really, really key is, again, it's not just listening to the customers and observing. And so when we were on the roof uh, one day, we noticed that one of the crew members accidentally kicked a box of bolts and those bolts fell over. You know, some of them rolled down into the gutter. Mm -hmm. Um, That was an annoying thing for to happen to him, mm. but that would have never been communicated to us from him or through a focus group or even through maybe um, someone down on the ground. But that observation led us to say, you know what, we should make the box have a shorter Z height so that the center of gravity is low as possible. So there's less chance of it falling over. That's, that's something that, again, wouldn't have been told to us by a customer. But when we did that, now the box isn't falling over as often. And for whatever reason, the the installer may think, you know, it just went together smoother. I don't know why, but that other day it was a pain in the butt because I had to go pick up these bolts down in the pool, you know, that that fell off the roof. But today was was easier. Yeah. And so the difference between where we were at with Unistrut way back in the day and today, at least how we've approached it, is a, an accumulation of all these little, um, all these little things plus our, our, our bigger technology step functions like skip rail, um, but all these little things that just make the whole process go smoother. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's where, you know, kind of going back to the product development process that's um, allowed us to continue to innovate is really having that heightened sense of observing the customers, yeah. observing the users. And again, it's not just the rooftop guy, but how do they carry up the ladder? Can you, mm. can you carry that box on your shoulder easily with one hand? How do you load it into your truck? How does it get to the distributor? What does it look like when they first see it? Answering all those questions allows for the product and the system to go smoother through the entire channel Mm -hmm. and just removing friction at every single step is what allows us to just help accelerate the adoption of solar. How does software factor in? I hear all the time from uh, competitors, but mostly in the commercial industrial space candidly you know um at least one of your um sort of peers in the industry certainly leans a lot into how their software is uh, revolutionary and helps their installers Um, but i've only really thought about from the from the um the cni uh perspective where does software factor in as a what i consider up to now predominantly hardware-based company so going back to the three main components that um go onto a rooftop system, you have your panel, you have your inverters and your racking. When you or anyone is designing a system, it's fairly straightforward to do the layout of the panels on the roof. And you have these rectangles and here's where they fit. It's then maybe one step further, but um, not a huge leap to then do the inverters. For example, microinverters, one per panel, and you can do your uh, string diagrams through that. But the racking system uh, it takes a whole another layer of calculation because there's so many characteristics of the roof that determine the structural componentry needed for uh, a permitted installation. Now, every roof is a snowflake. 
even if you're in a housing development that has, you know, model A and model B, well, if they're on opposite sides of the, of the street, they have different south facing planes. <laughs> so it really is, um, really is different. And so where the software comes into play is um, we've developed our initially our tool did all of the structural calculations for a given roof um, mm-hmm. in an automatic fashion. Um, and that has streamlined the ability for installers to not have to look up structural tables that would you know, historically be in PDFs or Excels of, okay, how many roof attachments do I need? How often do I need the attachments? Um, what, what's my roof angle? What our software does is automatically, uh, and we've done some integrations with front end um, layout. Uh, and proposal tools like yeah. Aurora Solar, for example. Yeah, so there's an API. I was going to ask that question. So you've Correct. got like integrations and you can choose Pegasus. Right, as so the, it'll, you do right. your layout in Aurora or or, or several other uh, layout tools. It'll import into our tool with the modules laid out, automatically do all the structural calculations yeah. for that specific roof, um, create the bill materials, and uh, on the back end, um, put together an entire permit pack that you can then send to your um, AHJ authority having jurisdiction, like a city or county, uh, to receive a permit. I was wondering which comes first, the the design in Aurora or the design in Pegasus. And the reason I was wondering is whether a user could test different racking solutions inside a tool like Aurora to see what their layout possibilities are. Because as you and I know, some racking, not all racking is created equal either. And some racking mm-hmm. gives you more functionality, more more coverage. Well, I think that's one of the areas I'm really excited about is how do we leverage, and this is where we're going with our tool, um, how do we leverage the technology we've built to help installers and even sales teams optimize their, um, their process in terms of selling to homeowners? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, a home with one array of 20 panels is going to cost significantly less than a home of 20 arrays of one panel each. Even though they're same KW, obviously those are unrealistic, but it proves the point that the racking is going to be significantly different. And so those are um, some of the tools that you know we're, we're looking at of how do we help installers optimize their um, their designs and just, again, make that whole process go much smoother from sale to install. What needed to be true in order for this business to work? I think timing is everything. If you started 5, 10, 15 years ago with the products you have now, would they have succeeded, right? Like what, what evolution of the marketplace or even technology enabled you to be able to do what you're doing now? On the software side, uh-huh. certainly the computing power and, and the the cloud space, again, 2012 mm. was early days in, in many respects on that, has allowed us to develop uh, a tool that is just significantly faster and, and mm-hmm. more scalable than uh, would have been done back then. Right. Um, on the hardware side, uh, I really think it is the, the scale of the industry mm. um, where we're able to serve our products to a broader segment of the of the economy. I mean, back then it was California. That Mm -hmm. was like the main area and maybe New Jersey. Right. Um, But we're, we're shipping our products all over the Midwest, East coast, West coast. Uh, It's really amazing to see that. And that scale has allowed us to understand and again, observe what the different problem sets are in those different regions. Yeah. And um, tweak and, and make sure that our products meet all those areas so that, we can deliver something that is cost competitive in Kentucky that mm. wouldn't have been that way 10 years ago. I mentioned in the intro that you stepped out of a job to start this business. How did you fund this venture initially? And uh, I, we'll get into uh, more of the sort of the initial idea and founder story in a minute, but I'm curious, did you raise any money or is it all self-funded? How, at what point did, uh, did how, what were the various mile markers there? When I started the company, I quit my job with no, you know, n- no paycheck in sight, so to speak. Um, I had been saving up uh, to get my MBA. That was a, you know, a traditional path of engineering undergrad MBA 
grad mm-hmm. school. I've been saving up for that. Um, and I decided to, instead of using that savings towards grad school, um, use it towards effectively living expenses and starting a company. Right. So, um, the real was, world uh, MBA. Yeah, the real world MBA. And, uh, I've, I think learned a, a, quite a bit during the whole, whole process. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Um, but that was, uh, some initial money to, you know, get the concepts going, but then, um, was able to raise money from, uh, a number of angel investors, people mm-hmm. who've, um, been in, in the solar industry for quite some time. They saw, uh, the ideas I was working on and, and where that could go. Um, so a number of angel investors, did they come out of like the installation side of the business project development? I'm just curious, like their background, it's being in the solar industry can be, can mean many different things. Mm -hmm. It was a wide range. Um, I've had some of the angel investors were out of module manufacturers. Okay. Some of them were from, uh, large scale installers. Some of them were, um, in uh, utility scale solar Mm -hmm. development. Um, so it's been a, it's been a wide range. I think the common theme among many of them is the passion for solar energy. Yeah. And, um, I, I think seeing, uh, seeing the approach that we've taken to, to help move the industry forward. Yeah. I think what's fascinating, uh, you told me that you started the business as a go to the beach business. What does that mean? <laughs> Yeah, so when I uh when I started the company, the original idea actually was a commercial rooftop system. Mm-hmm. And I had done a a fitness infomercial product ahead of that. No way. Yeah, I don't know this story. Yeah, so um had my come from a, a long line of engineers. So I'd invented this uh device for um uh Fitness, like a home home fitness apparatus. Yeah. Electronic pulse to the abs. You were the original yeah, exactly. ab butterfly guy. I'm <laughs> no, sure it, was, it, it was a uh, it was like a sit up type product. Okay. And um, so patented it, made prototypes. You know, hired someone on Craigslist to help make a mock infomercial. D- this is while like, you're at um, SoCal Ed. Yep. Oh yeah, gosh, night, this is nights awesome. And weekends kind of nights thing. and weekends. Okay. And uh, actually made an infomercial for it, like you know, spent a thousand bucks on a videographer, but made it look really good because, you know, infomercials are so corny anyways. It's not that hard to copy and, um, ended up sending it to like all the main infomercial companies and got, uh, interest enough where I went and flew to a pitch session and landed a licensing deal with one of them. You did. Yeah. And they're like, where else did this air? And I was like, this was my apartment. (laughs) This is not a real infomercial here. Um, Land a licensing deal, and uh, um, it it never really went anywhere. But the experience was really valuable because I learned oh, that whole process and patent, you know, first first uh, foray into patenting and and how to do licenses. So I was like, okay, I have this really interesting idea for a commercial rooftop system that um, is a, integrated into the module itself. So okay. similar yeah. concept to Zep, but on commercial. Uh huh. And why don't I go license this and then I'll just go to the beach. You know, this will be like a nice nine month project and then, you know, um, not have to do anything. Yeah. So that was the original idea, which completely went out the window. (laughs) You weren't on the (laughs) beach. You know, 15 years later. Yeah, that that didn't happen. It's more than that. You you had this idea. You had the, you got the technology um, license all set up. But you ran into a significant hurdle. Yeah, the the company that we were working with at the time was, um, you know, everything was going great. And then all of a sudden they had serious financial trouble and uh-huh. declared bankruptcy. So, yeah. So this is a company was, that effectively was going to give you the go to the beach business. They'll license the technology. They'll take it on. They'll commercialize it. You get mailbox money while you hang out. That, that was the idea. You yeah. know, it, How, we what's the incubation period yet? here? Like go get t- patents and license, get company that eventually went bankrupt to say, yes, we'll do the license. What was that period of time? Um, it was nine months into it when they went bankrupt. Nine months. I mean, that's not a long time. But no. As a young entrepreneur, it's an eternity. 
but yeah. that's really in the grand scheme of things not a long time well okay. and you're you're seeing you know bank accounts dwindle quickly for sure and every yeah. month is like oh wow okay yeah so um, how did you pivot from there well we um i had brought on a little investor money at that yeah. point and basically went to the investors and said hey we need to um take this into our control effectively and try to manufacture this ourselves. And this same product is the commercial rooftop product still? That Correct, at the time. But the okay. concept was around a module integrated system. Right. And around that same time, Zep Solar was acquired by Solar City. Right. And so there was this, and You're... Solar City had taken off the market for their own internal consumption. And so there was like this jackpot gaping hole in the market for... I remember this clear as anything. We were at yeah. Trina. Um, Ann and I both were at Trina at the time. Yeah, yeah. Basically giving them the the keys to the kingdom, like having opened the city, solar city doors to Zep, which ultimately, and validated for them that um, that model of module integrated with solar city and uh, Vivint. Um, yep. And when they took it off the shelf, basically said, nobody else can buy this. I remember looking around and thinking, Pegasus is the only option. This is genius. So we, and literally, like until very recently, I still thought that Pegasus was module integrated somehow. Well, we we were back then. We yeah. uh, pivoted effectively, or or you know, I like to use the word tact as a yeah. sailing of course reference because uh, we're still heading in that in that upwind direction, just mm -hmm. a different path, uh, and uh, decided to go into residential which is really a different solve for on the engineering side you're on a slope yeah. roof not flat roof attachments totally. versus ballasted um etc um but the concept of a module integrated system where you can get the panels or modules everything pre-installed they click together and just really again accelerate that installation process um, is where we refocused and had brought in some more money and, and investors saw that opportunity was that being off totally. the table now. 100%. But the thing with Resi is, unlike going and getting a big company to license the technology, now you need to go get a big company to buy it. You need to go get a Vivint or a Solar City, right? You need somebody to say, yep, I like this. I'll well, give you. And so that's what we were able to do. We landed at the time the third largest installer in the country, which is Sungevity. I see where this is headed. And we signed a 150 megawatt contract with them. Yes. And so we're like that was, Were your investors instrumental in helping get tee that up? They weren't instrumental. Because um, that's a big get, right? It was they, a big get. Yeah, that was... Um, folks don't remember now, but Sungevity was in the same vein as Vivint and Solar City. They're the third largest in the nation. Uh, yeah, I mean, at that at that moment. For, bigger than for, Sunrun still at that day. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, that was just through relationships with uh, some of the other team members at, at the company that we were able to... Um, get to know them and and move forward. So we signed a 150 megawatt contract, I think, and you know, You're basically thinking, go to beach money. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm thinking I'm getting my butt over to China. Yeah, and how do like, we how actually the make these make this? these things in the mm -hmm. factory? So yeah, went to all kinds of module manufacturers throughout China and um, Thailand yep. and Korea, etc. Um, and so we were building up inventory and and working with the module manufacturers on how to get our components installed we had had built effectively a small fab line in the bay area we're up in richmond california to do it as a interim step um which we were doing to fulfill near-term demand by Sungevity. right and then uh then they decided to go bankrupt they decided not, not decided but they went bankrupt and yeah Man, so I mean, this is now like, what, like three, four years into the business. Yeah, this is, um, I think, 2016. It okay. was. Yeah. So you're four years into the business, and both of your launch partners have gone bankrupt. Yeah, it was uh, talk about tough lessons. <laughs> what do you What do you do? I mean, there were many moments of like. Do we shut this thing down? Do we like? How do we work through this? We got all this inventory. You know, we had uh, our suppliers had had um, fronted a lot of inventory to help mm. move things forward, and yeah. we didn't we just didn't want to leave them hanging. That was really a big consideration. 
is, you know, they had believed in us and I had spent a lot of time with their team members over there. Um, funny enough, our, our head of supply chain was the former head of supply chain at Zep Solar. So it was a lot of the old Zep suppliers. That's cool. <laughs> Who was that? Um, a guy named James Shea, who's still our head of supply chain. He's, yeah, he's been a, a key member of the team. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they had put a lot of time and effort into developing and creating our inventory and, and product and to leave them hanging would have been, um, yeah, I think just really tough. So it's, how, how do we muscle through this? How do we get through this? Yeah. And honestly, I'm, uh, it's still a blur of how that, how those months went uh, there were, there were moments where it's like, we have like a week or two of payroll in the account. And yeah. how do we get through this? Um, but this is where some of the learning around the product development process started to kick in. And we had developed for our module integrate system a flashing, which for those who don't know is effectively a, a product to avoid water ingress into your roof if you have like a bolt going through it or a screw. Mm -hmm. um, we developed a flashing that uh, we could adapt to work with just generic rail-based systems. Um, other rail competitors back then, some of them did have flashing, some of them didn't. Right. And so we were up in Richmond, we're near SunPower's headquarters, um, and got to know their team just through, again, being in the industry for a while. Being at the same brewery on Thursday. Yeah, exactly. And they... Um, they decide to switch over to our flashing product. And that was really a lifeline for the business back in 2016, 2017 to kind of rebuild. And we realized that, okay, here's where there's a revenue stream. This customer really likes it. They're selling it, sending it out to their dealers who really like this product and our design. Um, and so we started selling it through distribution, uh, starting with Green Tech San Diego. You know, to be honest, it was a grind for a good two years there of selling just the flashing oh my to goodness. build the business because it's not a sexy product. It's not like the the main and, and this thing is this people look at. Is this pre Insta Flash? Oh yeah. Yeah. This is just a traditional flashing. This wow. is like twenty seventeen, twenty eighteen era. Got it. Um so a lot of driving around, knocking on doors, giving out samples, um and that just you know push got us into probably, um, I don't know, maybe 50 or so end contractors who are using mm. our product uh, across yeah. the nation, maybe 20 different distribution branches. And from there, we realized, do we want to recreate a module integrated or rail system? Do we want to create something different? And I think this is what led down to the path of um, our our process that we have in place is we said, well, let's create a customer council. Let's create a group of contractors who use our product that represent different areas of the country and different size um, customers, anywhere from your mom and pop installer with one crew yeah. up to multi-state, multi-crew operations. And basically went to each one of them hmm. with a clean sheet of paper and said, what do you want? Like wow. we don't have any, you know, we've been pitching Railless forever. We've been pitching module integrated, but we're going to come to you and, and not pitch. We're just going to listen. Sheet. Yeah. Clean sheet of paper. What do you want? And so we went through all the different features and benefits of all the different types of systems out there. And that uh, created a, a, a feature list um, that enabled us to develop our rail system. Um, wow. We, so in a sense, we had to eat our own own words because we've been pitching against Rails when we launched our module right. integrated system back in the day. But this is what customers wanted. And I think that goes back to an earlier point. It's not just cost. It was the ease. So one of the challenges we found um, is contractors, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's effectively a religious experience. They really, really like what they're using. And so finding something that's innovative, innovative enough where there's a reason to actually look at your product and switch to it 
but not so different that there's this barrier of training or learning something new right. or too mm. different. The idea and of I innovative think enough. Innovative enough. It's like if you go too far, it depends on your customer base. Construction in particular, I think, at large, um, if you go too far too fast, people are going to be, I've been doing this for 10 years. I want to do it my way. Yeah. You know, and so there's this intransigence effectively to, to, to change. So it has to be innovative enough where there's an interest to try it out, but not so different where there's this um, barrier to learning it. Um, and that's where we developed our rail system where, okay, again, rails have been done since the dawn of time. It's not that different, but here's a number of different features and benefits that make it worthwhile mm -hmm. that you're going to have a better day on the job. You're going to have a smoother process. There's going to be less of that annoyance because the bolts rolled down the roof into the gutter. That's just not going to happen with our system. Um, and so we developed that, but we had, you know, a heritage of railless. And so the idea of our skip rail system actually was born in 2019 with the realization that um, module manufacturers want to have limited SKUs in order to manufacture at scale. And so they design a panel to work everywhere in the U.S. to have effectively one SKU. There are wow. some that make, mm -hmm. you know, different, um, slightly different variations. But in addition to that, distributors only want to carry one set of SKUs. They don't right. want to carry a, a ton of them. Mm -hmm. And so the realization is that modules are designed to withstand a snow load of a Colorado or, or a hurricane in Florida, which right. means that they are inherently overbuilt for the San Diego's and Sacramento's and Peoria's the and majority of the places they're being Dallas. Installed. Yeah, exactly. And so how do we take advantage of that inherent strength right. and allow for a cost optimized and material material optimized system um, to to be installed? And that's where skip rail came about. Yeah. And effectively what skip rail does is it allows installers and distributors, this is an important point, that's both of them, to have one set of SKUs, a rail-based system, yeah. but allows for them to optimize structurally and cost-wise the amount of material being used yeah. by reducing or skipping rails in those areas that are lower load areas. Yeah. Um, and so you have this amazing opportunity to optimize almost job by job. You know, the example I give is, you're in you're in Sacramento one day, you're doing skip rail. You're up in, in Lake Tahoe, you're doing dual rail. You have the same set of SKUs on your truck, same right. product, same same training that your crews have gone through. You guys do an incredible job. And since one of the things that we talk a lot about is how do we tell the story? How do we actually package this well into a story? I'd love mm -hmm. to, uh, I want to share something I found on your website, which is the skip rail video. For those who haven't seen it, I'll turn on the audio. So if you're listening to the episode on the podcast audio, that's fine. You'll be able to hear this, but you may want to jump over to our YouTube channel so you can see this because I, and I, this is true. Like I've installed lots of different systems. I'll install one of the first S5, like railless systems. I, and I did one, I did it on a 500 kilowatt project. I installed one of the, um, like the early pro solar and Unirac stuff. I've installed a lot of solar, uh, despite people thinking I'm traditional media. Um, and this product really impresses me. And it wasn't until I saw this video, Kai, even though I've spent time with your team in person, it wasn't until I saw this video that I understood skip rail. I, wear, I wore a skip, skip rail shirt for 12 <laughs> months before I understood what the hell skip rail does. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna play this. Installations use two rows of rail per row of panels. Instead, the skip rail clamp structurally connects rows of panels in one simple This step. video, this part right here is what blew my mind. When I saw that, where it, you said it literally skips, and I saw this little hanger here, I was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, this makes so much sense. Like, this is reminiscent of the old Zep rail system, right? <laughs> it's so yep. brilliant, except you're not attaching. You're not attaching yep. to the roof. I'm going to keep going here. I think there's a couple of more interesting things. Right, boom. Seven and so on, including all of the roof penetrations. Boom, all the mounts, roof penetrations. Rails and clamps. That's right. Entire rows, rails, clamps, and mounts are completely eliminated. The result is a dramatically faster and lower cost installation using fewer materials and less work. 
17% fewer roof attachments. I think this is interesting. 32% fewer rails and clamps. 19% fewer roof attachments and 32% fewer rails and clamps. 21% fewer roof They're attachments. showing different states and different uh, applications of, uh, of rooftops. Just... So I think people can go and watch the video. We'll link to it. Uh, but I want to give it as two, an example of two things. One, this is not, um, even though this is like, in, in essence, a sales video, it's not a boring video. And I think that you've done a decent job. I love that you as the CEO are the spokesperson of mm -hmm. the video. And I love that you are showing the actual efficiency gains. You, the thing that stuck out to me, Kyle, when I watched this, apart from just being going like, oh, wow, I, now I understand how this product works, is you nail the who's it for of this video, right? Hmm. You speak to the decision maker who's trying to decide buy that product, not to a homeowner, not to a distributor, not to anybody else in the industry. You speak to the person that's going to buy this product and why it makes sense for them. And I love that. And I think that more people should follow this example. If you're looking for a good example of a product demo in a way that feels like it is illustrative and not salesy, Pegasus nails it on this video. Kudos. Kudos on I appreciate that. that. It was a lot of fun to make. It was also a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Especially no going doubt. to all those different job sites in three different states. Yeah. You went to South Carolina. That's cool. That's not, that's not yeah. far from where I'm at. Tell me, uh, I want to, uh, I've got, as we kind of turn towards uh, home base here, there's a couple of things I want to unpack. Um, tell me where your love for sailing comes from. Oh, that's a, a family tradition. Um, my grandfather was a big sailor. Um, up in uh, Connecticut. He was also a, an engineer. He built four sailboats by himself in his, my parents' or his backyard, my dad's backyard. One of them was a four, uh, 38 foot boat what? and just incredibly resourceful guy. I mean, one of my favorite stories my dad had, and this is just, you know, talk about OSHA issues left and right. He needed to make the lead weight for the keel. And so he got an old water heater, chopped it in half, got a bunch of lead, melted it in the water heater in their backyard and poured it into a no. form in the ground. <laughs> no mask, no gloves, just, okay, we're, we're, we're doing this. Um, My and so he, he sailed, um, extensively, which, you know, my dad grew up on a sailboat effectively through, through that childhood and, and that, um, you know, had me on a boat when I was in diapers. And when you were, your dad got to a certain point, he decided to retire. I mentioned the intro that you sailed through Central America and Mexico. That sailing trip changed your life. How so? Yeah. So yeah, and it wasn't just the sailing trip. It was also what led, led to the sailing trip. Mm -hmm. um, my dad had been... Uh, like I said, a lifelong sailor and introduced my mom to it, who also learned to really love the, uh, the lifestyle. And mm -hmm. they took a big, a, a big leap by leaving their careers. Um, and they, they were inspired to go on this, what at the time was going to be a one year sailing journey. <laughs> when I was in middle school, we were going to, mm -hmm. I was going to be homeschooled. Go like 12 years old. One year. Exactly. Yeah. But um, leading up to that, my dad had, um, had found this boat that he really wanted five years ahead of time. And so we had in our kitchen this, we want to go leave on August 20th, 2020, or 20, wow. year 2000, August 20th, year yeah, 2000, 2000, in 1995. And so it was this really clear goal setting that I observed mm -hmm. as a young kid of having a, a big goal that, um, and seeing my parents work towards that, was such a inspiration in itself. And then and to you know actually what boat have it happen. Right? Yes. Um, that boat's now, it's a family member, right? It, it is. We, my parents still have the boat. Um, What's it called? The boat's name is Indara. Indara. But what uh, the boat that inspired the trip was called Pegasus. Oh, really? Yeah, the boat that inspired uh -huh. the trip was called Pegasus. And so that was where the name of the company comes from is it was this this uh, catalyst, this ignite Man. that led to this five-year journey to then actually make this big dream come true. That is so And funny. we ended up going on the sailboat 
uh, Andara, and we sailed down west coast of U.S. Um, through western Mexico. We had two Kia Sera 120-watt panels that are still on the boat today producing producing power. Yeah. Um, living off grid and um, was just so, you know, saw firsthand kind of the 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 rugged beauty of the entire coastline, um, which really got me interested in in how to preserve that for future generations, yeah. which is what led to being interested in renewable energy. But we uh, we ended up going because it was such a great time going for a second year down through all of Central America through the Panama Canal. Um, you went through the canal through, through the Panama Canal through the locks. Yeah, through the locks. That's so yeah. cool. And then up up the Caribbean, up to Florida. And, um, yeah, amazing. Exp- I mean, totally life-changing, especially yeah. being a, a young age like that in the open ocean and having to rely on yourself. And this is, I mean, internet was like no internet on the Nothing. boat. For, yeah. Right. Sing- single sideband radio. You know, you're going into some town in Mexico to an internet cafe for dial-up yeah. for 30 minutes. Yeah. But you're, so you're 12, 13, 14. Yeah. Are you doing night watch on this boat? Yep. Yeah. So we do three hours on, six hours off. Yeah. And was, yeah. I mean, must, have been, just, must have been there, hilarious coming back to the States after that. Like the level, level of responsibility you had at such a young age. Yeah. I mean, I was a little shocked when I was, you know... I was like, oh, you can't have a driver's license yet. I was like, really? Well, I've been sailing this boat halfway around the world. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. But Oh, my goodness. Um, I want to show folks something because I think that I'm, I'm actually, you sent me this video and I was like, I, I don't know, maybe we'll show, maybe not. But given what you shared, uh, there's an interesting correlation. I got to say, there's another video that if you are uh, able, you should come watch along with us on uh, on YouTube because... I think that this really well, really perfectly captures kind of a blending. And I, I'm telling you, when I watched this, the first thing that came to mind was the Dollar Shave Club video. I was like, yep. this guy, this is not Kai's first time in a video. And, um, and now that you tell me that you did an infomercial, like it all came together. <laughs> I was like, Wait, this is great. So another f- passion of yours, which is it's just logical given the story you just shared is kite surfing. Something that we share is this passion and love for kite surfing. And so I know, I know that you shared this with me because you thought I'd get a kick out of it, but I'm going to share it. New technologies. People naturally ask, does it really work? Can I trust it? The Pegasus InstaFlash is a mount for composite shingle roofs that comes with a pre-installed non-hardening sealant. It creates an instant watertight bond and it's engineered to work in the toughest conditions from blazing heat to icy cold. You can even install it in the pouring rain. But does the seal really hold under a lot of water, even at high loads? <laughs> Let's test it. Kai's now the holding a kite board in his hands. And for those not watching, it's a, uh, a fast drill through them mounting a plate and effectively creating a see-through version of a kite board where... Presumably, Kai is going to use it out in the ocean for kite surfing with an Insta Flash. Yep, that's stalled on the bottom. Mm-hmm. So the idea here, Kyle, uh, Kai, is to go kite surf with it and see if water comes through into this reservoir that you've installed on the top. Yeah, it was, it, it was like let's do some ridiculous test, kind of like MythBusters. You know, we've yeah. already done the technical like videos of how it works totally. and all the benefits. I love this part. Through its pace. Kyle, Kyle is here. my favorite. Kyle here, braving <laughs> the Bay Area's frigid waters to see if InstaFlash's non-hardening sealant can hold up against the most extreme So then conditions. Kyle, Kyle's uh, not brother, rips through. As you can see, InstaFlash did exactly what we wanted it to do. It may not help you catch air, but on the roof, it'll let you shred. How was it out there? But super fast install, no cocky mess, and all of Bro. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. I think folks should go watch it. We'll link to it. And if you don't want to go watch YouTube, we'll link to the videos anyway uh, so that you can see them uh, at your leisure some other time. I think that it really well captures the, um, un- again, something that I've noticed about Pegasus. And I think we'll end on this. Like, how do you infuse the spirit of curiosity and fun 
into the business? Because it seems to me like that's a big part of who you are and how you think about building this family, not just a business. And you've brought on you know, folks like Andrew now to take on the work that Anne was doing. Like, how, how do you think about that culture? You know, it's something I totally underappreciated for several years when I first started the company. And I think that was either being young or um, more of an introvert or perhaps um, just early in management. But now I realize that it is one, if not the most key thing in the company, is having that culture where, you know, this is a, a serious business and we're, try we're solving a serious problem of accelerating the adoption of solar. But, you know, we have a day-to-day -day life that we're all partaking in and we need to have fun while doing it. We need to be um, enjoying each other's company and um, just having a good time. And so um, keeping a light attitude, you know, having that humility, peppering in fun things like these videos um, is just, it, it's just part of our culture now. And it, it's something that we really take seriously. When you reflect on the last decade plus as an entrepreneur, are there any particular salient lessons that you feel like you can pass along to other entrepreneurs, maybe because you can show them the writing on the wall, they don't have to go through the same experience themselves? I, I think a couple of things. One is I heard it a lot when I was younger, and it's back to the point you just made. Culture is really, really, really key. It's really key. Do not overlook that. Another thing is if you think it's going to be a short win, like prepare that it's going to, when you want to start a company, plan like you're going to be in it for over a decade. It may yes. not be that long, but you know, you only have so much time to, in your career, like when you, when you want to be working, so to speak. And so just be really, really sure that you want to do whatever the idea is. Having said that, be, um, know that there are different ways that you can morph the business Mm -hmm. to, um, you know, change your approach. When I started the company, it was licensing the hardware. And now I spend a lot of my time on the software development side. So it's, it's like a different company. So there is that ability, but, you know, this was something I was planning to be involved in for two years and it's 12 years now. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, you were, you know, there's a lot, a lot to, or, or I still feel like we're just getting started and it's super fun. Um, I think the one last thing on that, of, of a new entrepreneur is um, really, really think about not just the customer, but all the touch points through the chain, like mm -hmm. remove friction at every level, whatever area that your product or service is in, it's not just the person the, that's paying the bill. That is a very key component to it. Right. But think about how whatever it is flows through the entire channel and how you can move for friction along all those different touch points. A couple of uh, quick lightning questions. Any particular book that either has had an, an undeniable impact on you or uh, perhaps that you've read more than once and would pass along as an influential piece of literature for the audience? One of my favorite books is Shogun by James mm. Clavell. I've read that twice because um, it is such a massive book. Mm -hmm. And they just made a, 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 a show about it. But yes, to answer your question, Shogun. By James Clavell. Okay, mm -hmm. fantastic. And is there anything that you do consistently that you feel gives you leverage? It's something that's a habit or consistent practice that for you has really helped you dial in. Working out, at, I try to work out four days a week. Yeah. Um, that's just a, a way to get some mental clarity. And And I think part of that is finding the rhythm that works best for you rather than trying to force yourself into a rhythm. Kai, I am sure that there's more than one person that wants to connect with you in some way. Where do you like to be found? How, what's the best way for folks to connect? Uh, I'd say either LinkedIn or email. Um, mm -hmm. And what's that email? Kai at PegasusSolar.com. K-A-I at PegasusSolar.com. And Kai, if you could leave every person you meet with one thing, what would it be? I think it'd be just, you know, take a deep breath. Like so often we're just hustling, hustling, hustling. It's like, take your foot off the gas for a minute. Hmm. See, see where you're headed. See where your career's headed. See where your family's headed. 
Finally, what will have changed as a result of the work that you're doing? My hope is that the work that we will have done will have truly enabled a faster adoption of solar through uh, lower cost hardware, through a higher accessibility to a better technology, to enabling more people to enter the industry who may not have the uh, resources or training through easier products to work with, um, and to enable products and to push the industry to really focus on delivering something that lasts a long time mm -hmm. and isn't just going to be replaced in five years. We'll all be, hopefully, right here watching as Pegasus delivers on that promise. Kai Stefan is the founder and CEO of Pegasus. You've been listening to the last hour or so of us digging into not only how he thinks, but how he has evolved uh, the thinking on this business, the product, and most importantly, the customer. If that's you, please reach out to Kai. Uh, and Kai, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to share your story with us. You bet, Nico. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.